Hello everyone and welcome to Sky Scholar. In our last video I discussed some of the first experiments demonstrating the attainment of lattice confinement nuclear fusion. The work had been brought to my attention by a viewer. Initial experiments were conducted using deuterium, but nothing prevents the concept from being applied to the fusion of other nuclei. This is the beginning of what promises to be years of new and exciting research. Today I wish to focus on the comments of yet another viewer, this time relative to Shabilsky's star, also known as HD 101065. Shabilsky's star contains heavy elements with extremely short half-lives. The existence of such elements challenges the idea that heavy elements were made in first generation stars, dealing a severe blow to the standard model. So let's review the comment from Tinfoil Scholar. Shabilsky's star has plutonium in it. Shouldn't that alone refute the standard model? But no, they would rather invoke aliens as an explanation. Robbie Robot 574 responded, Hmm, no, they do not invoke aliens as an explanation. But in fact they do, as you will soon learn. He goes on, The most accepted hypothesis is that it contains elements in the island of stability, like fluorovium-298, that decay into the detected exotic elements. He ends with his claims that the evidence that support the standard solar model is overwhelming. He does this despite the fact that Tinfoil Scholar was discussing Shabilsky's star and the stark reality that the evidence for the standard model is very far indeed from overwhelming. Relative to Shabilsky's star, we begin with classification, a topic I had covered in this video. When the discovery of this star was first reported, it was classified as a GO class star as reported in the journal Nature. Here is what Shabilsky wrote. The spectral type of this star as estimated from the continuum and later confirmed by three color photometry undertaken at my request by Mr. J.B. White Oak is KO. The spectrum, however, shows strong hydrogen lines corresponding to class F8 or GO. The assumption that this star may have a composite spectrum could not be substantiated by the appearance of the spectrum in the violet region since the strength of all bomber lines uniformly corresponds to that of a GO star. A GO class star is a star like the Sun, yet if you read the Wikipedia article on this star, they do not even mention the initial discovery paper. Rather you learn that the star's classification is now AP, meaning a peculiar A class star. That is a little strange since G-class stars have a surface temperature like the Sun and an A-class star has a much more elevated temperature around 8 to 10,000 Kelvin. Moreover, three-color photometry had set the temperature of the star even lower like a K-class star with temperatures in the 4,000 to 5,200 Kelvin range. Classifying it as a G-class star must have been a problem for the solar physicist as this corresponds to the Sun's classification, something that hits a little close to home for the standard model. Here is a quote regarding the classification problem. Part of the controversy surrounding HD 101065 has concerned its effective temperature. That was discussed briefly in paper 1. None of the standard abundance Karutz models can fit the observed colors and hydrogen line profiles. Effective temperatures in the wide range 6000 to 7500 Kelvin are required to fit the various features. The problem is that they cannot account for the line intensities if they do not raise the temperatures in their models. Next we move to this paper demonstrating that Shabilsky's star rotates extremely slowly. Astronomers set the most probable rotation period at 188 years. They were able to determine this rotation by observing the position of spectral lines and quantifying the extent of Doppler shifts attributed to motion. The slow rotation is important as it enables scientists to get extremely sharp spectral lines. Since the lines are well defined, the identification of elements becomes certain and that is the problem for the modern theory. When Shabilsky first presented this star, he noted that it was extremely poor in iron and nickel as compared to the sun, yet rich in heavy elements like the lanthanides, including the following. As now confirmed in this paper, which did not examine the unstable elements. 
William Bedellman found the clear presence of extremely heavy and unstable elements in the star as outlined in this paper. Here is a list of those elements along with the half-lives of the longest lived isotopes for each. You will notice that promethium is included, but in his second paper, Shabilsky had written, Promethium, which follows neodymium in the periodic table, has no stable isotope and therefore must be absent in the spectrum. Yet it was not absent, it really was there. Remember that the heavy elements in sun-like stars are supposed to be made by first generation stars which went supernova. The material was then eventually recaptured as a new star formed. Since it takes millions of years for a star to form, then it is impossible to account for the presence of these relatively short-lived elements in Shabilsky's star. That is why Shabilsky wrote this sentence. On the scale of star formation times, it is impossible to conceive how these elements could possibly exist on Shabilsky's star. The longest lived isotope of promethium has a half-life of only 17.7 years, which is a blink of an eye in the life of a star. The longest lived isotope of Einsteinium only has a half-life of 472 days. Only a few of these elements might survive long enough to be seen, and only if they were made in enormous quantities by the proposed first generation star, which is highly unlikely. So how does astrophysics solve the problem? Well, believe it or not, one of the solutions is to invoke aliens. Here is a quote. Advanced civilizations might use stars to store nuclear waste, a notion broached by Daniel Whitemire and David Wright as far back as 1980 and considered as well by Carl Sagan and Josef Shlovsky in their Intelligent Life of the Universe. Whitemire and Wright even opined that the most likely stars in which we would find such pollutions were late A-class stars like Shabilsky's star. Here is a more tempered quotation. There is another even farther out possibility that intelligent aliens put the radioactive elements there as a kind of chemical signpost. Carl Sagan and Josef Shlovsky along with Frank Drake had raised the idea of looking for radioactive elements like promethium in stars as a possible alien signal. I found that sort of silly. Why would aliens dump their promethium in stars? What would the point be? To get our attention, I guess, but I think there are easier ways to get our attention. It's neat that somebody said, hey, we should look for it, and then somebody else found something that seems to match what they predicted. But I wouldn't put alien technology on a serious list of things that might be going on with Shabilsky's star. So it seems like tinfoil scholars' reference to aliens was right on target. Astrophysicists are the ones who propose the idea, and although Wright tempers the discussion, he still claims it as a farther out possibility. Since the alien idea is probably out, the next idea was that the heavy elements on Shabilsky's star were formed in an adjacent neutron star. Here is a quote. A neutron star, observes Paul Glilster in Centauri Dreams, is one solution. A companion object whose outflow of particles could create heavy elements in Shabilsky's star and keep them replenished. The solution, he writes, seems to work theoretically, but no neutron star is found anywhere near the star. So now neutron stars are out. It would seem like the most logical solution at this stage would be to admit that the standard model does not work. But wait, there is yet another idea. Why not propose that extremely stable and extremely heavy elements produce the observed heavy elements on Shabilsky's star? In fact, that is what has happened. Astrophysics and members of the nuclear physics community are now proposing that ultra-heavy and stable elements exist. They were stable long enough to survive after being formed by the first generation stars. Here is the quote. There is reason to believe, though, that there might be longer lived elements higher up in the table in an island of stability that experimenters have not yet reached. This is a region of the table of the isotopes that might have unusually stable members because they contain a magic number of neutrons and protons. He then cites Wikipedia. Many physicists think these isotope half-lives are relatively short on the order of minutes or days. Some theoretical calculations indicate that their half-lives may be long on the order of 10 to the 9th years. 
He then continues, Enter Zuba, Flabum, and Webb, who propose that the source of the short-lived actinides in Sibilsky's star is one of these isotopes. As the isotope decays, its daughter products, all less massive than it, but still actinides, are visible in the star before they decay away. Zuba et al. suggests that it might be the product of a supernova explosion like other neutron-heavy elements. Its half-life could be short enough that it would be present on a young A star, but very rare on Earth. Or perhaps you need a certain kind of supernova to make it, and one of those wasn't in the mix that generated the elements that make the Earth. If so, it could be common in other stars and planets, but just very hard to detect in anything other than an AP star with levitation. We are being told that we must now use elements that are supposedly super stable, but never naturally seen on Earth, because the supernova that made our elements was not of the proper kind. Robbie Robot 574 tells us that fluorovium-298 is the answer, but unfortunately only about 90 atoms of fluorovium have ever been made so far. Fluorovium-289 has a half-life of only about 2 seconds, and fluorovium-290 might have a half-life as long as 19 seconds, but its existence is unconfirmed. Fluorovium-298 has never been synthesized. In this paper, it has been predicted that the lifetime might be about an hour. But even such calculations have to be considered with caution, as the experimental confirmation exclusively deals with isotopes that have extremely short decay times, ranging from a few milliseconds to a few minutes. It would not be reasonable to predict decay times on the order of millions of years using such data. So at what point are the astronomers willing to admit that they have a problem? Astrophysics should stop denying that the Sun can make all the elements and their problems will be solved. Our current theoretical models are simply wrong. It's time to move beyond the standard solar model. So in closing, thank you Tinfoil Scholar for bringing up Shabilsky's star. If you enjoyed the video today, promote the channel, mention the video to your friends and to your local astronomy club, support me with a like, and subscribe for more videos as we look more closely at the sun, the stars, and beyond. Comments are always welcome down below, and I'll see you soon on our next video.